Hello, Gregor Arturo here with the Prometheus Initiative, and today we're going to talk about something very interesting. However, this discussion is very theoretical, concepts I'm still working on, and I want you to help me here. I really want your help, I want your input, I want people who can think about this geometry and how it can flow, and then how we can reconstruct it. It's using the concepts I described about before, but with a more complex piece of geometry. This being the vector equilibrium, otherwise known as the cube octahedron. Now, I'm going to share um, a lot of background info on this uh, shape for the moment being. It's made out of 13 spheres, or 13 vertexes, 12 on the outside layer, 1 on the inside layer. This was originally the, the person who discovered this shape first, a man named Buckminster Fuller from the early uh, 1900s and he called it the vector equili e equilibrium. The shape is also called the cube octahedron because it's made out of squares and triangles. Now it has 14 faces on the outside, six square faces and eight triangular faces. So it's basically this little guy put together which has eight triangular faces and six square faces. Okay, so another interesting thing about this is the five platonic solids you can take each of the shapes like this one and put it inside a sphere and each of the points will touch the sphere all five platonic solids do that are the only five shapes with the same faces um, within the, in, within that specific shape that makes that up same with this guy except it's made with two different types of faces what's most interesting about it is the twelve in relation to the one I made this thing completely out of Toothpicks, 36 of them. 24 on the outside, 12 on the inside. And if I made something like, oh, perfect example, this guy. This sort of relates to why I have a center point inside the octahedron. The toothpicks on the inside, I had to cut shorter to make it go in on the inside. Same with the square, same with all three of the other platonic solids. The vector equilibrium, all the lines are the exact same length. Everything is equally distant from everything else. And then how he described it, uh, Buckminster Fuller, is that everything is emanating from the center point outward in 12 perfect vectors. Okay. So let's talk more about applying this concept to vortex theory. So the vectors. Now what's neat about the vectors on the outside of this is let's say one, let's choose one triangular face. We've got a triangular face right here, and the vector, um, I'm making the vector is going in a, uh, what I have here, clockwise fashion. So it's going around in a clockwise fashion. I made a little bit right here. Oh, I had a little spinny thing to show what direction it was going in, but this one's going clockwise, which is in this direction, and each triangular face the vectors are set up so each one's going in a uh, clockwise rotation. So basically if I took a little marker and marked each one of the triangular faces so it goes in a clockwise direction, that would make each square face then go counterclockwise. And the vectors doing the same, oh, there, 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 there. So these are going in a counterclockwise direction. Now to reconstruct us, I've had lots of different thoughts. The big one is the material aluminum. Aluminum's atomic number is 13. It's neutrons, and its most stable um, and most common isotope is 14 neutrons, or 27 atomic weight. Um, and this has 13 spheres with 14 faces. Now, I'm going to explain how this replicates aluminum. Well, aluminum has this interesting property, which I want to talk about and get other people's um, fill-in on, on how aluminum is this unique material in terms of torsion fields, which relates to the same thing as vortex fields. It's... I'm not even going to go there. David Wilcock is a big stay on the term torsion field theory. It's, related, it's completely intertwined with vortex theory, which is like different terms. <sighs> Anyways, it's been noted that aluminum can shield torsion 
uh, fields, torsion waves. And torsion waves permeate any, everything, even the lead, which lead will shield out lots of other electromagnetic radiation. But aluminum will absorb it. I have a, a friend who won't go near aluminum because he's very energy sensitive, and he just feels the aluminum absorb his energy. Aluminum, another thing to think about, Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is a obelisk, which is capped with an alumina period, a pyramid. Alumina forms on the surface of aluminum. Uh, that's why it doesn't rust. Or like uh, turning into, well it turns into aluminum oxide, like iron will keep breaking down into iron oxide, which is rust. Aluminum will form this thin little coat on the surface, and it's impermeable from uh, from further oxygen, so it's a very thin layer of aluminum oxide that covers all aluminum. Aluminum oxide is also called corundum. Um, people are more familiar with sapphire and rubies. Rubies have a little bit of chromium in the corundum to give it the red color. I can't remember what causes the sapphire blue in the corundum. Corundum is also on like sandpaper. Other name is alumina. alumina. And it's on the top of the Washington Monument, which is an obelisk, which is a cool concept to think about. Do I have my little, no, I don't have my mini pyramid. But a pyramid is pulling energy into existence. And so we're going to talk about that in relation to the Merkaba and the vector equilibrium. So hold on, let's see how long this video has been going. Nope. It won't tell me. Never mind. Um, so these two have two different types of geometry. One's basically focused inwards while the other one's focused outwards. And how a pyramid you can think works in so like the pyramid of Giza. Imagine the pyramid of Giza. You have all this air around it which is a lot less less dense. It's air. It's really light. And there's not much energy in it. Well the pyramid is solid, made out of rock, much more energy. And so Technically, where the energy is more focused upon is in the center of the pyramid, in that the edge energy, which you think of as all these little vortexes, it's working with the energy of the air, which is not as dense. There's not much energy in the system. So the farther you get toward the center of the pyramid, the more energy there is. It's pulling energy into existence from the center point of the pyramid. You got on top of an obelisk to connect this. And all the area around the obelisk that's coming down is energized by the pyramid. Otherwise, the other pyramid is pulling energy into the earth, feeding it into the earth and helping the earth grow, which is a whole other concept. It actually has to relate to what's happening with the earthquakes right now and the sun. The sun's really heating up. It's a whole other ballgame. So I'm going to stop this video right now, and then I'm going to start part two. All right. Thank you.